everyone for coming. I can see that we have quite a few participants. Um, we appreciate uh, that you've taken time out of your day to join us. Um, my name is Urania Balos Hall. Um, I will be uh, asking questions to our two panelists, uh, Lisa Emaiwa um, and Nathan Ross Adams. Uh, Lisa is an associate at Michelson's who works with various aspects of the, of the law. Um, her main focus areas include the laws around emerging technologies like AI and robots. Um, with our managing attorney, um, she contributed to the South African chapter of the Robot Law Handbook, which has a comparative study on the various robot-related laws in specific countries around the world. Um, so welcome, Lisa. Lisa, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hi. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, our second panelist is Nathan Ross Adams, uh, who's a candidate attorney at Michelson's. Uh, Nathan Ross is a creative thinker with commercial experience in the software and advertising industries. Uh, since a young age, he's been intrigued by the disruptive effects of technology. Um, his current research um, is a Master's of Law, and he focuses on the impact of artificial intelligence within the corporate environment and the regulation of AI. He's also pursuing a degree in computer science. Uh, welcome, Nathan Ross. Hi, everyone. I love your background. <laughs> um, so shall we get started with our first question? Um, Lisa, can you tell us um, what is artificial intelligence? Thanks very much, Urania. So if you've watched our previous video, you might know a little bit about what artificial intelligence is, um, as we briefly mentioned it before, but I think it's important to talk about it again. Essentially, artificial intelligence is computer programming that learns and adapts. It's the development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, and the programming enables AI to operate independently of human intervention. Okay. Um, and Nathan Ross, uh, what is AI law? So this is a very interesting question um, because there are various perspectives on what people consider AI law to be. But in our view, AI law is the law that's applicable to the regulation of the use and the development of AI. Um, it is closely connected to robot law. Um, however, if you think of the human anatomy, um, AI would be equivalent to the human brain. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be embedded in a robot um, to function. Um, and then the other common assumption is that um, AI law refers to the law of um, robotics where robots use lawyers in their day-to-day -day practice, but that's too specific. So it should be seen as a general branch out or body of law that applies to AI where it's regulated in any industry. Okay. Um, Lisa, then with that in mind, uh, can I ask you, what is data protection and why is it relevant in this context? I think that uh, we have this idea of robots in our minds, AI in our minds, but what has data protection got to do with AI? Um, let me just take a step back by asking you first, what is data protection? And then secondly, why is it relevant to the AI context? Well, when we think about robot law and AI, it's quite, it deals with various different fields and there's various different considerations we have to look at. So that includes looking at data protection, intellectual property and different aspects of the law. And why data protect, what data protection is just in general, it's all about protecting individuals such as you and I against the misuse of our personal information. 
because we live in an information age. And that means that data is essentially the new oil. It's very valuable. So everyone wants to be able to use it and use it. And the importance of data protection is that you use it in a way that protects the data subject, not just use it without, um, without any principles and things like that. So data protection law covers the laws protecting privacy and also protecting human beings. So organizations have to think about this as well when they think about protecting their clients. And it's just in general, as a person, we have to think about data protection. And the reason that it's relevant in this context is because at the end of the day, um, artificial intelligence will usually process personal information. And that means they'll use it to make the decisions, which are usually automated decisions. Is the only difference here and the issue that might be a bit relevant is that sometimes with AI and the way it's programmed, it won't necessarily analyze the data in the way it was originally programmed to do. Sometimes it will respond intelligently to the data and adapt its outputs in that way. So it's quite important that when we're using AI and when it's dealing with personal information, it needs to take into account data protection law. Okay. I see that we have a question from Peo. Um, I'm going to allow them to uh, ask their question. I'm Peo. Okay, I think we'll come back to that. Wait, let's see. Perhaps this is a technical. Okay, we'll come back to you, uh, If If uh, you can't ask the question uh, via microphone, would you type it into um, your chat and I will bring attention back to our uh, panelists. My next question then would be uh, aimed at Nathan. Um, I'm going to ask you two, two questions and maybe you can... Um, you can answer after one after the other. The first is, why do we have data protection? Why is it important? Um, and then, how does the law protect data? Okay, yeah, this is a very, very interesting and important question. Um, and it ties to what um, Lisa explained about the relevance of data protection. Um, with, the, with the growing advancements in technology, um, the the access or the, the ease of access to data has also become easier um, um, or it has become easier for data to be um, broken down misused stolen um, and there's also been an increase in cybersecurity risks so data protection should in its best way concern how data could be protected within that context um, and then why do we protect data? Um, well, because data is protected by fundamental rights like privacy, um, and these rights need to be balanced against our other rights, such as access to information. Okay. Uh, Lisa, is there anything that you can add to, add to those questions? I definitely agree with Nathan that it's, it's very key with access to information is that we so much is available right now, and we're dealing with data constantly. And sometimes it's even hard for us to differentiate when we're dealing with personal data. So adding data protection into this context means that we have to now focus on data that's identifiable to a person and ensure that whenever we're using it, it's protected. So regardless of the context, so regardless of whether we're, we're using AI, we need to make sure that it's protected. Okay. I see that uh, Sandra's asked an interesting question. She asks, does data protection law not state that a person may not be under certain conditions subject to rule outcomes that are automated? Um, she basically asks, can we embed AI into business rule process? So that is actually a good question and something we'll touch on because that deals with automated decision making. That's something we're actually going to touch on a bit later, but yes, that is something that data protection says. It essentially says that you can only make automated decisions depending on specific circumstances and if you meet conditions, but we will address that uh, a bit later. But thank you very much for that question. Okay, great. Um, then 
Nathan, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the question of how AI disrupts data protection um, and how ordinary principles are are challenged by by AI and the the data protection world. Okay, awesome. Um, so across the world in various pieces of legislation like the GDPR as well as uh, Papia in South Africa, um, there are certain underlying principles which um, govern data protection. Um, these principles are lawfulness, fairness, transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, confidentiality and accountability. Um, within the ordinary data protection context, these principles are close to, are, are actually quite important because they inform the laws as well as the decisions that um, people take in relation to data protection. But for example, when, when, when AI was introduced, um, it, sort of, it sort of changed and challenged these principles. And I'll just nitpick at a few of those principles. Um, for example, the principle of transparency. Um, AI can be, um, be structured in such a way that the, the reasoning behind decision making that AI takes cannot be understood by humans either because um, it, it's difficult to understand how a, a particular AI bot reached that decision or because the time that it would take for, for a company to investigate why an AI took a decision would be too expensive. So that challenges one of those principles. The next principle is the purpose limitation. Um, and there is a, currently a tension between what tech people and lawyers need. Um, lawyers would want to know that um, data, the, the purpose for which data could be used is limited so that we have legal certainty. Whereas people within the tech world would know that machine learning that, that forms the foundation of AI is currently unpredictable. Um, and so the, the outcomes that the, the AI um, with the machine learning could produce are, are not easy to predict. And so um, the, the purpose behind it is not clear. Um, then we will look at the principle of data minimization. So as my colleague Lisa mentioned, um, big data concerns massive amounts of data. Um, and this is contrary to the nature of, of big data in itself. Um, looking at the principle of accuracy of data, that may also be quite burdensome for, for companies such as research companies or, or data production companies to, to keep an accurate record of because um, the volume of the data is just too much and how will they process that? Um, and then lastly, with the principle of accountability, the ordinary um, privacy risk management strategies that businesses have in place for, for data protection in general may not be sufficient to apply to AI because the, how, AI, how these businesses would need to be kept accountable would need to be looked at in a more detailed perspective since th these other principles are challenged. So the, the data protection is being disrupted quite severely by AI and we are going to need to put on our thinking hats to come up with new ways of, of solving problems that AI brings up. Okay, so if I, let me just uh, reframe it, is, does that mean that, are you basically saying that the AI's capacity is so large that um, we have to, it's starting to challenge the principles of transparency, purpose, data minimization, so on and so forth? Yes, um, the way AI is structured is actually to sort of enhance um, the capacity that humans ordinarily have. Um, and because the processing power or the, the ability of AI to reach decisions, the, the, the time that it takes is much quicker than humans ordinarily process our own decisions. Um, it becomes very difficult to apply these ordinary principles to that situation, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, which then leads me to asking uh, you, Lisa, um, what is automated decision making? Okay. So essentially, when we think about the types of decisions, there are three main types. So the first type is obviously what we call a manual decision. So this is when a human being like you and I make decisions. And sometimes when we make our decisions, we're assisted uh, 
um, by a machine in that decision making process. But it's key that as long as there are there's a human being making the actual decision, then it wouldn't be um, considered an automated decision. Now the next kind of decision is automated decisions. So this is when a mach machine makes a decision in an automated way where they essentially just follow an uh, algorithm or instructions that have been given to it by a human being. It has absolutely no discretion and it does not learn from the experience or even change the decisions that it's making. It just makes it in an automated way. So think of it like this. When we're learning rote, we just, we're not trying to enhance our knowledge. We're just trying to make sure we get all of that in our head. So that's essentially how an automated decision would be. It's based on task-based programming. And with that, we can easily predict um, the outcomes of the decision. And within that, we think about an autonomous decision. So this is a type of automated decision that's made by artificial intelligence. Here, the artificial intelligence actually learns and makes decisions independently and on its own. So aut autonomous decisions involve non-task specific programming. So vague algorithms are inserted into a computer and together with big data, a lot of correlations are found. So within that, that means that the system learns through machine learning about what the relevant criteria is. And this is essentially, think about it as if um, the neurons in our brain, the neural networks are working within our brain. That's how the AI is learning in this type of process. So because of that, because it's essentially learning on its own, it can learn from its mistakes and get better with experience at solving problems. And as opposed to times with manual um, decisions where there might be some human intervention, with aut autonomous decisions, humans are completely out of the loop. So with that, with that in mind, we can't really predict the outcomes as easily as we could. So it's very important here that the algorithms might not actually be the same as they were before. Um, after they've been processed by the AI. Okay, so we have manual decisions, we have automated decisions, and then we have autonomous decisions. Um, and I think that leads me to ask, is an autonomous decision an automated decision? That is a really good question, Urania. So essentially, an autonomous decision is a subset of an automated decision because it's important to think of it in a broad specter and especially when we think about it within data protection context is that if it is a subset of um, an automated decision then data protection law should regulate the decisions of AI because AI makes autonomous decisions. When we look at the GDPR for example in the explana explanatory part of the beginning it says that in order to prevent um, or create the risk of circumvention, the protection of natural persons should be techni technologically neutral and should not depend on te techniques used. So when we're protecting natural per persons, we also need to think about doing it manually, and we also need to think about data that's processed autonomously. So if we, um, if, or sorry, automatedly. So that means that any decision that is made or any decision that processes personal information needs to be in line with data protection. So when we um, look at auton automated decisions, we need to look at it very broadly to include something like autonomous decisions. So decisions by AI will be automated decisions and we have to take uh, data protection into account. So now that we're talking about uh, data protection in relation to those decisions, um, Nathan, I'd like to ask you, how did the GDPR and Papia protect privacy under automated decisions? Okay, very good question. And I think this ties back into our um, question from um, Sandra as well, relating to the um, processing of automated uh, well, processing of um, data under automated decisions. Um, so I'll start with PAPIA because that's our um, home legislation. Um, PAPIA in section 71 provides that, um, or at, at actually prevents or prohibits decisions made solely on the basis of automated processing. So we could read that to say that 
if there is a decision that's made exclusively by AI based on personal data, um, our law does not allow that. However, there are two exceptions, and that is where um, the decision that the AI is taking is um, for the conclusion of a contract. So any commercial transaction that would amount to a contract would be allowed. Um, would, a decision by AI would be allowed within that context. And then secondly, where um, appropriate measures, as vague as it is, has been taken to protect the data subject's legitimate interests, um, simply meaning that something has been done to, to protect um, the privacy rights of the data subject. So in essence, what this means is that AI is allowed to be used as part of business processes, as part of um, contracting, provided that um, there are measures in place to protect the rights of the data subject. So that's specifically for Papia. Um, the GDPR, on the other hand, allows decisions um, or AI to make decisions. However, it also provides a right to contest a decision where, where someone um, is not happy with the decision that was made or how the decision was taken. What is not clear um, within the context of the GDPR is um, how that decision can be contested, um, whether you have a right to actually know whether you can contest the decision. And that's important for us to know because if a business is um, concluding a contract with someone and that contract um, uses AI to make a decision, um, the way the GDPR is currently, currently structured, leads one to believe that um, the business doesn't have to inform the, the data subject of their right um, to contest the decision. Um, and just taking that a step further, um, there, there are four sort of models that have been described um, for how a decision can be contested and what that would mean. So for example, if a data subject wasn't happy with the decision taken by the AI, would it require that um, another human being makes a decision? And then can this human being make the new decision assisted with a different AI? Um, or what if a human being were just to oversee the new decision taken by an AI? Or what if just another different, more skilled AI was used to make a decision? So there are, there are actually more questions than answers under this one, unfortunately. But um, our work relates to sort of figuring these out and um, getting the best viewpoints on that. Okay. Um, I'm, let's take a minute to see if anyone has any questions. Sandra, I see that you say that your questions have been answered. Um, if you have any questions, will you raise your hand and I will allow your speaker to turn on. I see Arette has a, has a question. Hi, um, I would just like to know, I see in section 71 of Popia that um, part of the appropriate measures that you mentioned does make provision for the fact that a data subject can make representations. Would this then include also the fact that you can actually contest the decision made by the automated decision-making model, whatever the case might be? Okay, yes. So, um, let me just get to this. Um, the, represent the representation itself is that the decision, the, the measure wasn't appropriate. So that would be a challenge to, to the decision. But I was more concerned about the fact that companies do not have to let the data subject know about this right. Sorry, am I still? <laughs> okay, so even if there's no um, responsibility on them actually to allow for the fact that there's a, a right, um, don't you think that they should include that somewhere if there is going to be a contesting on the fact? Nathan? Hey, sorry, did you catch that? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but, um, okay, so even if there isn't a right actually for companies to say, okay, fine, we have to include this um, yeah. in our submissions, um, the right still exists. So would that then mean that, that, I think what I'm asking is that would that representation then include the fact that there is a contest and obviously that brings it into the 
whole definition aspect that you brought in on the how the GDPR is interpreting it at the moment. Yes, um, and I, I definitely agree with what you're saying. Um, the GDPR has been using has been used as a sort of like guiding or informing um, piece of legislation for the interpretation of Papia. Um, I could, uh, as I said, it, it seems likely that uh, the right to contest is included. However, ultimately, this decision needs to be brought before court and they need to interpret the les legislation um, and determine whether it applies or not. Understandably. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Um, we're going to take one more question before we carry on uh, from Emmanuel Pillay. Um, he asks, how is it that our data is sold to many insurance businesses? For example, um, if we were on a website, it reads our IP address and sends an immediate email to buy. Is this legal? Lisa, do you have an answer for us? Um, I'm just trying to read the question in context. It reads our IP address and sends an immediate email to buy. Is this legal? I think it always, I think it depends on the website that you're, um, that you're on. It's not necessarily that your data is being sold, but sometimes cookies will, will um, collate certain data and, and they'll let you, that lets the person know if, who's accessed the, um, the website and then you'll get ads that are very much targeted towards you. So it's not, it's within the technology. It's hard when you say um, they're selling the data to the insurance company, that might not necessarily be true. And also with websites, it depends on the terms. Because if their website terms say that they may um, share this data with their advertisers with various different people, once you um, use their website, you're essentially agreeing to those terms. So it always depends on exactly what um, the terms of the website that you're on state. And if you've by using the website or by continuing to use their products if you're agreeing to be bound by those terms, which might include sharing your data. Okay, great, thank you. If I could just uh, add to that, um, Urania, the, the privacy policy that you sign in relation to, uh, or click to agree to in relation to giving your data to one website may mean that uh, th those terms give that website owner permission to share it with either their, their, um, their clients or um, collaborators. Um, and in that case, they can share your data. Okay, great. Um, Jarena, I see that you've asked us a question. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to leave it for our next round of questions, but uh, we will come back to you. Um, great, so Lisa, I'd like to ask you, the use of special personal information, um, how, how does, let me, let me rephrase this. Um, how do we use special personal information in automated decision making? That's a good question, Urania. And I think it's something that um, Nathan might have touched on, but when AI is making these decisions or these automated decisions. It might not necessarily, um, it might be, it might not be easy to define what kind of person or what kind of data it's using. So it's good to consider this when you're thinking about using an automated decision in your business process. So there are a few things that you need to ask yourself. One, whether you're making an automated decision. Two, whether um, you're using special person information to make these decisions whether there's some justification for processing it, and if you have some suitable measures in place. And I'll touch on each of these key questions and elaborate more. So firstly, let's look at what special personal information is. So this is information, personal information that relates to, for example, um, religious or philo philosophical beliefs, your race or ethnicity, your trade union membership, your health, sex life, or sexual orientation, genetics or biometric information, or even your criminal behavior. So it's quite a broad list of types of personal information. But we can see from that list is that it's special because of the level of sensitivity attached to that information. And it's usually not information that people would share openly in certain circumstances. So it's important to know that um, 
to know when you're using special personal information to make these um, to make these ultimate decisions. But it's also quite difficult when we think about big data to identify this. Um, so the next uh, issue is whether you're justified in processing this data. So, in this, sorry. If, if I may add that the, um, just going back to the sort of idea of black box AI. So black box AI is different from the usual, um, if I can say the word brand of AI, in that um, humans cannot or do not have the capacity to actually understand the reasoning behind uh, the decision. Um, and in that case, it will be very difficult for us to assess the where the special, the special personal data has been used and actually which element of special uh, special personal data has been used to actually make a decision because you need to think of it as there are several categories of information on which an AI makes a decision and that special personal data may be used in a way that is weighted higher than ordinary data and this is a great impact when it comes to um, credit agreements that you may apply for online um, insurance um, etc yeah i definitely agree yeah i think it's when we think about special personal information just when we make manual and normal decisions it's very easy for us to say identify oh there we're using special personal information but um, with, like you mentioned, Nathan, with AI, it's quite tricky, but it's also something we definitely have to at least consider. And <laughs> if, yeah, like if in a broader circumstance, you know that the data you're inputting might have it, um, so it might have it, when you make that automated decision, I think at least that level of consideration should be taken into account. Um, so then the next thing is whether you're justified in making, the, in processing the data. And there's, only two grounds of uh, justification for making automated decisions using special personal data. So that would be whether you have the consent of the data subject and if there are substantial public interests uh, which exists. So back to what Nathan said as well is that it's so tricky um, with AI to identify these things once you're dealing with uh, special personal information. But in general, it's important to have this in mind. And then the last consideration would be whether you have put uh, suitable measures in place. So at a minimum, there needs to be, uh, as Nathan's mentioned before, the data subject needs to have certain rights when it, comes to be, um, when it comes to making automated decisions using their data. So they need to be able to, there needs to be a level of human intervention on the part of the person who is controlling that data. A data subject has the, needs to have the right to express his or her point of view on this automated decision and, of course, to be able to contest the decision. So it's very tricky um, in, with the AI context to try and get all of this in place, but it's clear that having some level of um, involvement of the data subject is quite key. I don't mean to uh, put you on the spot because maybe you, you won't know offhand, um, and I'm... I'm um, sort of directing this at, at both Nathan and Lisa, but do we have AI that uh, works at such a, at such a level, um, as you guys say, uh, autonomous, that makes autonomous decisions that could possibly um, work at such a level that we don't know what data it's taking in? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I think you do. Okay. Um, yes, we do currently have um, AI that is currently making autonomous decisions. It's not readily commercial available, commercially available rather because um, of the costs in, in producing this type of AI. Um, but I'll just, I'll give an example of, of one that has entered the South African market recently, and that is um, Law Geeks AI. Um, it's an AI or contract review system that um, reviews non-disclosure agreements um, better than lawyers. That's their tagline, and it's been proven to be as such. So in that case, um, in a non-disclosure agreement, you're dealing with certain types of, of confidential information and um, what is not clear from the special personal data point of view is what if that confidential information is special personal data? Um, and Lisa could add on to this if she wants to, but um, it's more important for us to know 
whether special personal data is present or not. And for that to happen, these specific types of AI need to be sort of programmed to, to flag that so that it can be brought to our attention. Because if we take a, a, a what you call it, an after the fact approach where we actually have to look at whether this data was um, special personal data, um, it becomes very difficult um, to, to sort of assess that. So the ultimate thing is that measures need to be built in place for AI to actually present when it uses special personal data to us. Okay, so almost like um, we're asking it to be self-regulating in a way. Yes. Okay. Um, so my last question for the day uh, relates to uh, what's currently affecting everyone in the world, which is uh, the coronavirus. Um, and I was wondering if uh, either Lisa or Nathan, uh, or both, uh, if you'd like to, if you can give us real life examples of the use of AI um, in processing health data during the coronavirus pandemic? Mm -hmm. So um, there are various uses of um, AI in the coronavirus. And I think it's very important because we can program it, we can program this to help us, for example, do contract tracing, contact tracing. Um, so it's been used to find all of the people that may have been in contact with someone that has the coronavirus and things like that. Um, and also some companies, for example, in the US have used AI enhanced thermal cameras to detect fevers. Um, so AI is being used in this process. I don't know, Nathan, if you have a bit, some examples yourself. Um, yeah, so um, going back to special personal data, this may actually be, or well, the coronavirus is actually a great example of for, for, just, uh, for the justification in processing special personal data because it's within the public interest that this is done. So um, an example will be um, hospitals um, that are using AI in separate countries to determine what the causes of infection or the sources of, in of infection are. Um, I am aware of the World Health Organization using a specific, a particular type of a medical AI that looks at the um, how the coronavirus is uh, affecting the lungs of infected patients and how it differs to other respiratory disorders. Um, in that case, special personal information is being collected and it's justified because there's global interest in um, figuring out how the virus works. And um, if AI can be used within the context, it is justified. Mm -hmm. And I think you actually raise a very good point, Nathan, about these justifications, is that in this time, we still need to make sure that AI is used responsibly and follows data protection principles. And you said that one of the key important ones are justifications. So when we're using data and processing data, we have to do it and we have to do it in a way that it's limited to a specific purpose. And this purpose in this um, day and age of Corona is that we're trying to either track the spread of the, of the disease or we're using this data for public health reasons. And it's key that when we do that, we're only doing it for that purpose and we don't process it for further, um, for further processing, for example, using the data to sell some insurance and things like that. So it's key that we limit the processes. Mm -hmm. And another key, um, Thing that we have to keep in mind during this time is that we should try where as much as possible is to anonymize the data. So, for example, some countries are actually tracking individuals suspected of having the disease, but other countries, for example, Austria, Belgium, and the UK, what they're doing is that they're collecting anonymized data to study the movement of people in general. Um, so that still helps uh, governments have the ability to track the movements of large groups, but what it does is that it minimizes the risks of infringing someone's personal data. So I think what the key aspect of this is to make sure that we're not trying to uh, infringe people's personal information or privacy as much as we can. And also going forward that with the new use of all of these technologies is that we're not going to go forward and, um, and oppress or infringe on someone's rights going forward because of what we've learned in this process. Definitely. And uh, I'd just like to add, and this is for all of our attendees as well, our, our main purpose is for AI to be used in the 
the most practical and commercial way as possible. We don't, we don't believe that AI should be restricted to the extent that um, it doesn't become commercially viable for a company and they cannot, you know, it can be, cannot be used for its main purpose, which is basically to innovate, automate, and um, to, make, uh, to move humanity forward. That's ultimately what AI is about. We're concerned with how it is used, that it is used ethically, that the regulations that are created that will apply to it um, consider both the end user as well as the company, um, as well as the potential liability that could result from, from using AI because um, as, as many companies are aware, there are different insurance schemes that would need to be taken out if you use AI because they are potentially damaging decisions that could be taken. Um, and, uh, a simple example is if you if someone applies for a, a loan online and um, the data is used to make it, uh, the, the decision is taken by an AI bot um, and the AI bot makes it a decision and um, that's registered with the National Credit Bureau um, and negatively impacts that person. In that case, that decision needs to be contested because it's having a negative impact on the status of that person. We're just concerned with regulating that process so that AI can be used effectively from both angles. Thank you. Um, is there anything that either of you would like to add before I open the floor up to questions? Uh, nothing from my side at this stage. Nothing from me either. Okay, um, so then let's go to Jarina, who asks, what does the law say about AI in predicting human behavior in companies? Um, th th I think that needs to be placed in more context because um, I, off the top of my head, I can see it being used in advertising. Um, if, if the data that um, companies um, collect, if they use that for their own advertising or sell it. Um, there are sort of policies that need to be in place for that. And um, the people that are signing away their data need to be aware. So if it's employees, for example, they need to know that their data could be used for employee wellness systems, et cetera. I don't know if you want to add to that, Lisa. No, I think you've actually hit the nail on the head. I think it's important to let the data subject know or whoever the, the, the AI is going to process is that they know that it's happening and that they agree to it as well. Because, some, because a lot of the times with artificial intelligence, we're not really aware that it's happening in the background, especially if it's using our data. So I think having a level of awareness is key. Uh, Jarina, do you feel that your, your question has been answered? I will unmute you so that you can, you can chat to us. Uh, maybe, uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe I should just give a little bit of background on this. We're in the business of um, preventing fraud and corruption. So the question is, because of the AI, we can start make collecting information within an organization, obviously do the right thing and protect it and encrypt it and everything else. But using that information to start predicting when a person might become a fraudster within the organization. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. I think one of the biggest concerns with that would be about bias um, and whether the AI might have certain biases because of how it's being programmed and things like that. So I think that would be something that would need to be considered um, because it maybe it predicts that someone is a fraudster based on certain criteria that's been inputted into it or programmed into it, but it could be incorrect. So I think a key issue with that would be looking at the biases involved when it's making those predictions. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Nathan? Yeah, um, for me, the biggest element over here would be consent, um, because consent is rather vague within the context of AI because you don't know what you're consenting to. Um, but um, if there is, for example, I'm just, if, if an employee is recruited and during the recruitment process that employee sends information like um, and does biometric and um, personality assessments, um, it's important to look at whether part of that recruitment as well as appointment process deals with um, consent to having their data processed 
for um, to predict criminal behavior to to um, um, and and I would also add that it's also it will also become very industry specific because I can see in the um, financial services industry you would want to know if if someone has um, a propensity to um, commit financial crimes, you would want to know that, but it wouldn't be relevant to someone who doesn't deal with anything related to finance, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Andrew and Emmanuel. I'll start with Emmanuel. Um, he asks, can AI be used to generate buying behavior from a data subject? For example, if you sell products on a large scale to the public having their data, can you run AI to run through their social media texts and discussions to have a feel um, of whether they prefer talking about and in turn selling the type of product that is somewhat niche? Um, Emmanuel, would you like me to, um, I'm going to unmute you just finding you um, so that you can perhaps frame your your question hello hello uh, yeah I just wanted to find out if um, basically if you, if you can run an AI through through social media um, given a set of data and uh, if you're able to basically look into the discussions that people have and to be able to produce or sell products based on those discussions. One, is AI able to do such a thing? And two, is it legal or not? Okay, this, this is a sort of tough question because one of the important considerations is who owns the platform that the data is being um, scraped from because that's what it is at the end of the day. So for example, Facebook does use AI algorithms to um, produce targeted advertising based on the profiles of the people on there. And they own other platforms such as um, WhatsApp and, uh, other, and Instagram and other text message platforms. And they allow to, to um, sort of use the data from those um, sources because they um, have entered into agreements with the people when they sign on to their platform. It's one of their conditions for doing so. Um, but if it's data that is, um, um, what you call it, not readily available, um, if it's in some obscure source and there isn't, again, an element of, uh, element of consent or the data hasn't been purchased from that company, because uh, that's another um, consideration that the, the personal data of, of, of a people can become or can be considered as databases. And in that case, it's... Uh, it's possible to commercialize that. So um, that needs to be looked at when a decision is taken. And if you want to add to that, Lisa. I think you actually nailed it because that's the biggest issue. Who owns the data and where are you getting it from? Because I, it would make sense if, like you said, Facebook does this all the time, but I don't think that um, a random company can get on social media and then scrape a whole bunch of people's data because you're not the users don't have consent and they're not aware that you're doing that. So in that context, that doesn't seem to be allowed. But however, if you're the owner of the social network, you should, you might be able to do it. And you agree to certain terms when you log on to that platform. Okay, great. Um, I would like to move on to Andrew. I think this will be our last question for the day. He asks, in your opinion, can automated decision making ever be used for direct marketing? A direct marketing message is always to the detriment of the recipient because it demands attention. She planned to devote to something else. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it, it can be used in direct marketing. Just to um, go back to the point that um, Nathan made with Facebook. Facebook uses AI and that's why we have targeted ads when we um, log into Facebook. It, it knows what we've looked at, what we've clicked on the pages and things like that. So it can be used in direct marketing, but like with most things, including direct marketing, we need to make sure that what it's, when it's processing that data is doing that within the confines of data 
protection and within and doing that within the uh, conditions. So if it direct marketing has an added layer of um, conditions when we use it in the context of data protection. So I think that's key with um, direct marketing. Nathan, anything else? Uh, yeah. Um... Again, it's also the purpose for the direct marketing. Um, if um, you you need to also look at the the purpose, and I've mentioned that, but also the where where the data is coming from and um, where it's going to. So um, in South African law and in the uh, in the South African law and in the GDPR, there are very specific rules that apply to this. But other jurisdictions may have um, their own laws which apply. We also need to consider the fact that we need to look at where the data is housed, like, um, and we refer to this as data warehouses, where big data is stored. So although Facebook has its platform and in, in the um, everywhere in the world, um, they may have the data stored in Ireland or in the UK or somewhere else in the UK. Um, if that data needs to be accessed, that jurisdiction needs to be followed to, to sort of get access to their data. So their laws would apply and we, we could provide opinions on that. But ultimately, the question, any question related to AI will be very context specific. It depends on the facts and um, also um, who is involved in the process. The players are important, as well as who controls the data at the end of the day, because the, the requirements for the data controller um, are very high. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that we will wrap our webinar up from here. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, please think of Michelson's when you want to send any instructions or require any opinions um, that are AI related. Um, Lisa, Nathan, thank you very much for your time. Um, if you as an attendee are interested in AI, um, AI issues, keep an eye out for our, our mailers and we would be interested to know what actually interests you and what sort of um, areas in, our, in AI and data protection interest you. So uh, let us know and we will have a webinar very soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks for attending and your questions. Th yeah, thanks again, everyone, for putting in your questions. And we will be also writing this series of follow up posts on your questions. Um, and we may refer any other posts that are, are currently in existence to you guys. Thank you.